thanks very much, Pablo, for the introduction again. So I'm trying to give in about seven minutes some thoughts about my way of treating late detected DDH as you asked me to, although I can't call it the best current practice, I can only call it my try to do my best. So I won't talk about the traction, close reduction, technical aspects of arthrogram, medial and anterior open reductions, the technical aspects of all the details that we'll have all those experts later talking about. I will simply go through my general protocol of late EDH, and in particular, about, I'll talk about the issues and complications I look out for and how I try to manage those. Um, late has been discussed, what's late? I think from a management perspective, I agree with Estefania that six months onwards changes the protocol. And therefore, this is what I consider late for my talk. And I'll go through with some examples through my aspects of management. I'll start off with the bracing, which I use in late DDH only if the hip spontaneously reduces in abduction or is already in. In a case like this, where a nine month presents with quite significant dysplasia, 35 degrees acetabular index, Sleep time bracing over a year's time, which the patient tolerated well, led to an almost normal hip at age two and a half. So there is a role for bracing in late detected DDH, as long as the hip's in. If we have a case like this, where we have a three-year-old presenting with a mild limp, the left hip subluxated, lateralized, Shenton's line is broken, it's a bit more severe. It's the question, what are we going to do? Is it... I think quite obvious that the left hip is dysplastic enough to need a pelvic osteotomy, but with the subluxation, does it require an open reduction as well? And in a case like that, I use anterior ultrasound in clinic to see if the hip reduces in abduction. And if that's the case, we may be able to combine some bracing with an operation. The anterior ultrasound will be discussed later in more detail again and explained. And it basically is an axial cut, like an axial MRI, where we um, use an anterior ultrasound from the groin area. So in this case, after six weeks of abduction preoperatively, the arthrogram then showed the hip to be centered with no medial dipooling, no subluxation, and quite a large cartilaginous onlock, and therefore only a pelvic osteotomy was enough and was able to avoid intraarticular surgery in this case. The, the close reduction is something that I feel works rarely only in over six months of age. I still try and do an arthrogram first, but often the arthrogram shows at an attempt of close reduction a insufficient concentric reduction and or too much abduction is required to keep the hip in safely. This is a case where an MRI was performed after a close reduction attempt was done. And this arthrogram, despite being not satisfactory, in my opinion, was accepted. And the MRI shows the infolded labrum, obstacles to obstruct, um, to reduction, infolded capsule even, and an unacceptable scenario where I think we have to proceed to an open reduction in order to have a chance to get a reasonable outcome. Um, if we talk open reduction, the medial open reduction has the advantage of being able to reattach the shortened ligamentum teres for some stability at the remnants of the transverse ligament. but since it's been reported to have a relatively high type 2 AVN rate, I personally prefer doing an anterior open reduction um, through a Smith-Peterson approach and in the younger children without a split of the apophysis and then doing a careful capsularophy with an avoiding tension on the supraatal capsule to come with, because that can compromise the femoral head diffusion like we know 
from uh, skiffy scenarios and also from the uh, nice post-operative MRI studies after close reduction. It also enables us to do a pelvic osteotomy, but that only comes into play in slightly older children. The walking HDDH I usually treat with an anterior opponent reduction and pelvic osteotomy. Sometimes femoral osteotomies are required depending on how tight the scenario is. This is a two-year-old walking in funny. That was the referral from the GP. And this kid needed the works, was treated with bilateral anterior open reductions, femoral shortenings and some derotation and bilateral pelvic osteotomies. We can get those hips in, but like also mentioned in a previous talk, it's not normal thereafter. And we look back over a 10 year period where 41 hips were, had enough follow-up of the late detected walking age cases, and almost half of them had a growth disturbance and only a bit more than half had excellent outcomes at five-year follow-up. And we're not even talking at 40-year follow-up. Whilst if we looked at the group of successful public harness in early detected DDH, the success rate was 100%. So I perfectly agree with all my previous speakers that the outcome of the late detected DDH isn't great. And we need to improve that and get early detection and treatment for hip dysplasia. But so for the late ones that we have gotten in, we still have to watch out for those growth disturbances. And in particular, the Kalamshi type two lateral growth disturbance is a silent killer of hips because it can develop quite slowly and late and puts pressure on the lateral acetabulum and can actually go a, let, get a hip that looks reasonable, go backwards over time. This is an example of a four and a half year old, very ligamentously lax child with a unilateral hip dislocation was treated with an open reduction and pelvic osteotomy, which then was initially looking not too bad, but further down when we look at the direction of the physis, it shows the physis is starting to get more and more horizontal and the acetabular development is not progressing as hoped. And in a scenario like that, with a beginning of a type two lateral growth disturbance, I use a medial hemiepiphysiodesis screw to try and guide the growth back towards the cup. And uh, you see the acetabular remodeling has quite nicely happened over time and the physis is now in the right direction. In a case of more severe residual dysplasia and AVN, like this child that had a close reduction in spica age 15 months, I initially tend to wait and let them recover from the initial insult. And then in this case, after the, the, the growth disturbance had declared itself as again, a type two AVN with significant acetabular dysplasia, a guided growth is alone is not gonna do it. And this child was quite reasonably covered after a varus osteotomy and a Pemberton fixed with one screw in order to avoid a spica. But also down the track, these kids need to continue, need continued surveillance as I think the growth disturbance is going to continue even after our reconstruction. And so in this case, I tend to use, a, use guided growth after removal of the plate in order to continue the guidance of growth for further development. If we look at the late and residual dysplasia and deformity that often is a consequence of late detected DDH, I personally like Pemberton osteotomies. I fix them with a the screw to avoid a spica in older kids. I only occasionally use salt or triple osteotomies and we hear we will hear a lot about the triple osteotomies down the track. And if it's possible to wait, I wait for the most powerful adolescent PAO plus or minus relative neck lengthening. An example of a Pemberton, when the cup is steep and begs to be bent down, I do so. And even in age six patients, Pemberton osteotomy can lead to quite nice results and resolution of the hip dysplasia. In a scenario of a 
rather acetabular insufficiency where the cup, the acetabulum keeps about 30, 40% of the slightly enlarged femoral head uncovered, I think a reorientation is required and this can either be done with a salter, like in this case, or with a triple osteotomy, which Teddy Slonga will talk about in a lot more detail later down the track. If we are faced with very severe the residual dysplasia and growth, dis growth disturbance around age 9, 10, sometimes PAO or a Bernice triple are the only way of trying to redirect the acetabulum and can be combined with the trochanterdistalization in order to make room for the reorientated acetabulum. But in the younger children, we only do it if it's absolutely necessary in conjunction with our adolescent young adult PAO surgeons, and we would usually wait until skeletal maturity and then do the PAO and relative neck lengthening if so needed. In summary, I try to do my best to manage each case on its individual basis, trying to safely minimize the amount of intraarticular surgery to keep the AVN risk low and watch for growth disturbances. And if I see them, I consider guided growth techniques early and then deal with the residual dysplasia and deformities. I thank very much for the invitation again and apologies for some delays and lags in the presentation. The internet might not be the quickest today down in Sydney. Thanks very much, guys.